Hey, section 5.3. This is page 13, and I'm starting at the bottom half of that page. The special multiplication rule. So I want to look at a rule that talks about finding the probability of A and B that is adjusted for the special condition that A and B are independent, and that becomes kind of a simpler rule than we had before. I'm going to go ahead and start off by writing down the general multiplication rule that we saw a couple pages back. It said the probability of A and B would be the probability of A times the probability of B given A. And that holds all the time. You could always do an AND probability this way. But if A and B are independent, then the probability of B given A, according to the definition on the previous page, would just be the same as the probability of B. So the special multiplication rule says if you know two events are independent and you want the probability that they'll both happen, then instead of doing a regular probability times a conditional, you can just do two conditional pro or sorry, two regular probabilities times each other and that will give you the same result. So the special multiplication rule says if you're trying to do the probability of A and B, just take the probability of A by itself times the probability of B by itself multiply those together and that'll give you your answer. The if and only if says this could go be read in either direction but honestly the most common use of it would be this way that if we know they're independent we would find this and by multiplying them together. Um, you could do the backwards way if you knew that this was equal you would know they're independent but what we did on the example above is a better way to check for independence. This rule can be extended to multiple events, so if you have a list of events A, B, C, and so on, and you know they're all independent of each other, and you're asked what's the probability that all of these events will happen, A and B and C and so on, then if you know they're independent, you can just multiply the individual probabilities together. And that's a really useful thing sometimes, it can really save us a lot of time and effort in listing out our sample space. Here's an example that illustrates that. Consider flipping six coins and trying to find the probability that all six will come up heads. I would translate that question into the probability of heads on the first coin. And let me start that again. Probability of heads on the first coin, and heads on the second coin, and heads on the third, and heads on the fourth, and heads on the fifth, and heads on the sixth. So it's an and question of six things. But does what does the six coin coming out heads or tails, is that affected by the first one or the second one or the third one? If you think about it, the answer is no. It doesn't matter what happened on these five. This coin is going to come up heads half the time and tails half the time. And what happens on these five coins doesn't affect it. If we believe that to be true, we can apply this rule and say, well, since these tosses are all independent and since it's an and question, we can just multiply the individual probabilities together and that would give us the same answer. A little bit of a pain to write this out all six times, but go ahead and do that real quick. And then very fast and easy though to finish it off. On each one of these coins, what's the probability of heads? Well, on the first one it's one half, but that would be the same for the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. For every one of those coin toss tosses, it should be a one-half. So it would be one-half times a half 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 or one-half raised to the sixth power. And you could go straight to a decimal on that if you want or I'm going to work it out here. One to the sixth is still a one and two to the sixth would be sixty-four. So there it is as a fraction. There's a one in sixty-four chance of that happen happening. If we wanted to go to a decimal we could just divide that out on the calculator. So 1 over 64 is 0 0.015625. Now typically I would round a probability to four decimal places, but that would bring in error. And we could do that here, approximately 0 0.0156. But for just a couple decimals more, I get the exact answer. So I'll go ahead and leave it that way here. So that's a pretty quick answer for the probability of six coins all coming up heads. And if you think about it, it wouldn't be harder if it had been 16 coins or 6,000 coins even. I would just change this exponent from a 6 to a 16 or a 6,000. But what if I didn't do it this way? What if I didn't use this rule? Then I'd need to count. And to count, I need to kind of think about what's in the sample space. And I would think, well, if I toss 6 coins, I could get 
all heads. That's one thing that could happen. But I would need to know all the different things that could happen so I could figure out my denominator. And apparently, there's 64 of them. But it would be like, well, maybe I just get one head. And maybe that, uh, or sorry, just one tail. And maybe that's on the last toss. But then again, maybe it's on the next to last toss. And so on and so on. And I could just keep listing those out. That list would have, there's one, two, three possibilities. It turns out there's 64. And only one of them has all heads. So if I didn't know these were independent, I would want to go through a process like that, which would be very time-consuming and tedious, and it would get way worse if there were 16 coins. But this method will stay about the same. Just change the exponent, and you still get a fast, quick answer. Okay, continuing on to page 14, I want to show you another application of the special multiplication rule in independence. So let's take a look at this one. Studies have shown that whether a professional basketball player makes the second of two free throws is independent of the result of the first free throw. A player whose team is behind by one point with no time remaining is about to shoot two free throws. If the player is a 70% free throw shooter, then determine the probability that A, the player's team will win the game as a result of those free throws. So right then and there, um, or maybe they'll lose the game by missing both free throws, or maybe the game will go to overtime. So let's go ahead and look through those possibilities. I want to, want to write out some events here. So before I do that, well, let's just think about this. How does the player um, win the game right then and there? Their team's behind by one point. You have to, uh, you get one point for each free throw. So if they made both of them, then they would win the game. If they made um, one and miss one, it would go to overtime. If they missed both, they'd lose the game. So I'm going to let the letter A stand for a made free throw. And I'm going to let the letter B stand for a missed free throw. So how does the player end up winning the game right there by shooting those free throws? They would have to make both. So I'm going to say to win the game, the player has to make the first one, A1, and make the second one, A2. And if they do that, they'll score two points. They'll be up by one. It says there's no time remaining, so their team would win. So how do we do that? Well, the key here is that studies have shown that whether a professional basketball player makes the second of two free throws is independent of the result on the first one. So if we have independence there and we're doing an and question, we can use that special multiplication rule and say that we can just figure out the probability of making the first one and then multiply that by the probability of making the second one. And we actually don't have to figure out the probability of them making the first one. That's told to us right here. It says the player's a 70% free throw shooter. So what they're saying there is this player has a 70% chance of making a given free throw. So the probability they would make that first one is 0 0.70, that 70% chance, times the probability they would make the second one, but it's 70% on any free throw for this player, so that's just another um, 70. And it's the multiplication, so we multiply those two together. 7 times 7 is 49. So 0.7 times 0.7 should be 0.49. So it looks like if you have a 70% free throw shooter shooting two free throws, there's a 49% they'll make both, and in this case that would mean their team wins the game right then and there. The other option that you wouldn't like to think about if you were a fan of this team is maybe they're going to lose the game. That's going to happen if they miss both free throws. So I'd write that as B1 and B2, so they're going to miss the first free throw and they're going to miss the second one. And then I would want to break that up and do a multiplication again. And this isn't obvious, but if you only have two possibilities, and in this case makes and misses and they're complements of each other, then if makes are independent, then misses are independent as well. So all shots will be independent if there's only these two complementary outcomes. It gets actually trickier if there's like three different things that could happen, but if they're just two and they're complementary, then if there's independence in one spot, there's independence everywhere. So I'm going to go ahead and use that idea that these are independent to break it up into two spots again and say it's the probability of the first one times the probability of the second one. And what is the probability that they would miss the first free throw? We use a complement rule there. If there's a 70% chance they would make one, then there's one minus 0.70 or 30% chance that they would miss a free throw. And it would be the same on the second one. 
So I would do 30% chance they would miss the first one times a 30% chance they would miss the second one. 3 times 3 is 9, so 0.3 times 0.3 is 0.09. So it looks like if you have that 70% free throw shooter at the line, 49% they'll make both and win the game, 9% chance that they'll miss both and lose the game. But that's not the only way it could go down. The game could also go to overtime. So they're asking us to think about that one as well. And when we go to that one, there's a couple ways that we could do it. And I think the easiest way to do it at this point is to think about kind of the Venn diagram of the situation. We have all the things that could happen represented in our sample space. According to part A, there's about a 49% chance that the game, sorry, would be won by that player. So that would be a win. It's about 0.49. And then there's about a 9% chance that there would be a loss. So that's our 0.09. And then this part over here that's left over, that's going to be overtime. There's no overlap. These are mutually exclusive possibilities. And they add up to the total possibilities of what could happen. So they're going to total up to 1 with their probabilities. So I think that the easiest way to figure out the probability of overtime would be to just take the total probability 1, subtract out the probability that the player would win the game right now, subtract out the probability they would lose the game right now, and then all that should be left is the overtime probability. So I'm going to go ahead and do it that way. 1 minus 0.49 and minus 0.09, and we get 0.42. So it looks like the probability of overtime is 0.42, or 42%. And that's the way I would answer that question, given that I already knew the probability of winning and the probability of losing. It seems like the fastest thing to do to me would just be to subtract those off and get our answer that way. There is another option, though, and that would be to do it directly instead of using the subtraction method of the complement rule. So I'm going to put a C star here, and I'm going to answer that question again. What's the probability that the game would go to overtime? This time I'm going to think about it as if that was the first and only question that I was asked. I was told the player was going to shoot two free throws, that they're behind by one point, but people didn't care about the chance of winning or losing, they just cared about overtime. Then I would think about, well, what has to happen for that to the game to go to overtime? And the answer is the player has to make a free throw and miss a free throw. So I would say this is the probability of A and B. You might notice that I'm not numbering the A and B there. And that's because it doesn't matter which one they make and which one they miss. It could be they make the first and miss the second, or they could miss the first one and make the second, and that would still work. So I'm going to go ahead and do a numbering, but I'm going to do that separately and list all the different ways that have a make and a miss. So it could be make the first one, A1, and miss the second one, B2. Or another way it could happen is they could miss the first one, and make the second one. And either of those would be a make and a miss and result in one point and tie the game and send it to overtime. And the other thing that's important to think about there is they're mutually exclusive. It's not possible that the player could make the first free throw and at the same time miss the first free throw. So this is never going to be the way it happened at the same time that this is. And the reason I mention that is when you know that those possibilities are mutually exclusive, ors become addition. So I can do this problem by taking the probability of making the first one, and I'm going to do this with independence, times the probability of making the second one, and then the or is a plus, the probability of missing the first one, and multiply that times the probability of making the second one. So I'm considering both ways, make and a miss, or a miss and a make, and since either of those would work, I'm adding those options together. Also important, again, they, they're mutually exclusive. To figure it out from there is pretty straightforward. Their chance of making the first free throw is 70%. Their chance of missing the, free, the second free throw is 30%. Or, and that's our plus sign, the chance of missing the first one, 30%, times their chance of making the second, 70%. If you do either one of these, 7 times 3 is 21, so 0.7 times 0.3 is 0.21. Then we have another 0.21 here, so that would add together to be 0.42.
And notice that that is the same answer I got when I used the complement rule up above. So I want you to see that both ways work. Obviously this way was faster if we already had our answers to A and B. This is probably quicker if you didn't have the answers to A and B already, but it's important to see they're the same. And then also very important to see that I had to do both orders. If I had only done this order or only done that order, I would have just gotten 0.21, and that would not have matched my work from up here. When an order is not specified, I have to do every order that it could be and add them together, or I'm not going to get the right answer. And that's worth a special note that we're going to make right here. If there's more than one way that the event can occur, then we must add together the probabilities for all of the different ways. Now, a lot of times when I'm in the classroom and I ask that question and I ask people what would I put there, they'll say both of the different ways. And that would work here because it could be this way or that way, just two possibilities. But we're going to see that as events get more complicated, as questions get more complicated, there might be six different ways it could happen or 16 different ways it could happen or who knows, maybe even a million different ways it could happen. So when an event can happen in more than one way, we have to add together all of the different ways, no matter how many that is. And that may, may sound impossible. How are we going to do it if there's a million ways? But there, there is some tricks to it that allow that to go a little faster, and we'll see those in section 5.5.